The first lecture today, so before the break for the first hour, I'm going to give a very short history of the question of the nature of space um, and matter, um, because I want to part of how I, I want to present string theory as, in a sense, a latest development in a longer story. At the end of this first lecture, we'll, for about, we'll talk about that for about half of the first lecture, and then after that, um, we'll talk about classical string theory. Then we'll have a break, and after the break, uh, we'll talk about some basics, basic mathematical, physical ideas of um, quantum string theory. So today is about filling in the, the basic uh, physical ideas mostly um, we need in string theory, and then in the next two days we'll, use, we'll see where those ideas in, um, lead us. Tomorrow we'll talk about dualities, and on um, Thursday we'll talk about the derivation of general relativity, how general relativity is a, a prediction of string theory. But just to put the discussion in some historical context, and just to, I hope, make the idea of thinking philosophically about these questions more natural, I wanted, as I said, to put string theory in the context of a long history of investigations um, of the nature of, sp of space, of matter, and of their relationship. When I was preparing the lectures, I thought I would go all the way back to Plato, but I've learned since being in Brazil that your great education system will allow you to go back to earlier than that. And <laughs> I'm really, you know, you, will, you know a lot about these things. Um, so this is not even the beginning of the story, but it's an okay point for us to, us to start. Um, so we have uh, right, the School of Athens here, Plato and Aristotle, um, the detail from it. So Plato, I, 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 Plato had some very strange sounding ideas about this question about matter and space and their relationship. And I'm not going to give you a lot of long quotes from philosophers, but I think it's kind of interesting to try to think back into the mindset um, of, of Plato of this time and what, it, what thinking about these questions looked like. So I'll read this quotation to you. Um, he says, being and space and generation, these three existed in their three ways before the heaven. So what he's thinking about is the heaven is the cosmos as we see it arranged today, in particular thinking about the solar system and fixed stars um, apparently arranged around those. And it distinguishes these three things the translation says being, but in a sense he's talking about matter there. Space, and we can take that loosely to, to, to mean space as well. And generation, I think from our point of view you would think about that as the dynamics, the laws, whatever it is that makes uh, matter evolve in space in a certain way. But he's talking about generation. So he distinguishes these three things and these three kinds of existence, but it's also the case that these are more or less the same, one and the same thing, different aspects of, of um, one thing. Okay. That somehow being in matter and matter is just a form of space in some way. And then we get this story. The nurse of generation, moistened by water and inflamed by fire and receiving the forms of earth and air and experiencing all the affections which accompany these, presented a strange variety of appearances and was never in any um, part um, in a state of equipoise. So somehow space generation took on the different forms of matter, different parts of space took on, in this case, the geometric shapes of the different kinds of matter. And this was an unstable situation for Plato. So swaying unevenly hither and thither was shaken by them and by its motion again shook them, and the elements, were moved, when moved, were separated and carried continually, some one way, some another, as when rain is shaken and winnowed by fans and other instruments used in the threshing of corn. The close and heavy particles are borne away and settle in one direction, 
and the loose and light particles in another. In this manner, the four kinds, four kinds or elements, which is mentioned up here, earth and air and fire and water, um, um, were shaken by the receiving vessel, which moving like a winnowing machine, scattered far away from one another the elements most unlike and forced the most similar elements into close contact. Wherefore also the various elements had different places before they were arranged so as to form the universe. So what this understanding Plato's view is not going to be crucial for the rest of the lectures. But what I want to point out is the kind of questions that he's raising here and addressing, which are, I would say, say similar. Again, the relationship between space and matter, thinking of matter as somehow space taking on a particular kind of elemental form, and there's a dynamical relationship between space and matter. Space affects matter, and matter affects space in this story. Okay. Um, the net result, he thinks, is the different elements are sorted out, and then at some later time, rearrange themselves into the form that we, that we see now. So that's, okay, so an earliest kind of picture of um, taking up the question of space, matter, uh, space and matter, and uh, the earliest kind of answer that we're going to look at. I also put up um, Aristotle. Let's see if this works. Right over here. Um, Aristotle, Plato's this picture here, I mean, it's later, it's not an ancient Greek picture, but it pictures the Eudoxan Aristotelian universe, with the Earth in the center and the different planets arranged in spheres around it. Aristotle's picture is rather more um, um, sedate and uh, calm than, than the Platonic picture, and the basic picture is, he had to the five elements, he had the ether, the fifth element, which in this kind of picture forms uh, crystalline spheres around the Earth and rotate around the Earth, carrying the planets with it, recapitulating the qualitative observed behavior of the planets. For Aristotle, there's no vacuum, um, but matter, but rather a universe full of matter, but a bounded universe. It's spherical, and it's, the sphere is actually the limit of the universe for Aristotle. Well, let's see. Good. Moving through many th uh, several thousand years, the next people I want to talk about, Descartes over here. Um, we'll come to Newton in a minute. Um, some of you heard, saw this picture yesterday um, in the lecture that I gave. And let me talk a little bit more about it in the context of the current question. Descartes took up the question of what, um, what is matter, what is the nature of matter, the kind of question that we're going to be seeing in string theory. And his idea was matter is nothing more than um, being extended. So extension just means filling a vol an extension or being extended is filling a volume of a certain shape, having a certain three-dimensional volume in particular. Um, shape. And for, Aris, uh, for Descartes, any shape you could, any extension, any volume, any shape you could pull out, you could find, well, it's extended and thereby is matter. So he had a very simple argument that there could not be a vacuum. If you took a, a region that you thought was a vacuum, well, it has extension, so in fact it's, it's matter. What looks like a vacuum well, is something like what looks like in the air. It's just very um, mobile and easy to move matter that's in there. And, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, once you have this picture of the universe completely full of um, matter, I mean, there really is no distinction between space and matter in this case, because space, too, is just extension. For, Arist for Descartes, Arist uh, matter and space are just one and the same thing. Every region is a region of matter and a region of space, and those are just one and the same thing. He constructed the universe, so that's the question about um, what is matter, what is space, and in terms of what they are, what is their relationship. 
For the dynamical question, they can't then imagine the universe that must be completely full of mobile matter. And so the picture you come up with then is a, hydrodyna a hydrodynamical one. Everything you see, the dynamics of the universe, is just the flow of this flu fluid that completely fills the universe. Some of it moves in chunks, and that's why we have um, sort of macroscopic bodies or planets and things. Um, the rest is a very fine liquid that is swirling everything around. The picture to have is sort of a bucket full of uh, water and ice. So the ice is the sort of chunk, the larger chunks of matter. And on that basis, uh, he, the so our solar system would say be this region here. Um, S is the sun, and What's swirling around here is this space matter stuff it moves in a vortex in a circular pattern around the sun and carries the planets around it. That's how the planets move around our sun. Over here, so this makes the whole universe. So Descartes had the idea that there were many solar systems or cells, these sort of spherical cells of rotating matter. In fact, some of them have a sun in the center, but they need not. Some of them can just be balls of rotating uh, matter. So the universe, this is what this picture from Descartes' principles looks like. It's, you imagine the universe is composed of a load of um, ball bearings that are all rotating in different directions, compro compro squishy um, ball bearings, because they're made of this liquid. And um, sorry. up here, for instance, we have another one, but it's, not, it's also rotating around its sun but it's rotating out of the plane here. It's going like this. As it's going around here, and this one's going around like that, and so on. So, again, matter for Descartes, matter and space are just one and the same thing, and that does inform the dynamics of the situation, because that leads you to this hydrodynamical picture. Um, next up is Newton. This is actually a picture of his death mask. So when he died, and this was the the habit for famous important people put a wax cast, take a wax cast of their face when they when they died. This is Newton's death mask. It's pretty interesting. Um, so, uh, as you may know, Newton argued for the existence of absolute space in the Principia, and I sort of have a picture of this. What absolute space then? represents absolute space in this picture, which is a very different pic story about the relationship between <coughs> space and matter. For Newton, space is a fixed background arena in which matter, which is of a different nature, um, plays out its life, lives out its dynamical story. This is the framework for Newtonian mechanics, and ultimately, um, this is again from the Principia, and this actually represents, um, this is the diagram from his proof of Kepler's equal areas law, from the conservation of angular momentum from, with a central force. Um, but it does my picture just fine, and in particular what it represents is Newton's first law, so you imagine this is the line A, B, C, D, so on. That's the motion of a planet around the sun, S. And what's key in this drawing is the idea that if there's no force on an object, it moves in a straight line at a constant rate. So this is Newton's first law. Um, in this diagram, you sort of see that it will... Yeah. So it moves up here in a... You imagine a body moving in here in a straight line and then being hit by a force towards the sun, so it deflects. But the law says it keeps moving in this straight line until it's hit. And it's also important for Newton's proof that if it wasn't hit, it would carry on moving in a straight line at a constant rate there. Newton's, I mean, in a nutshell, there's more to it than this. But the key insight, the key point for Newton is, well, the first law says that bodies without forces move in straight lines at a constant rate. And that's just a meaningless sentence, a statement, unless you have something like absolute space with which straightness um, is defined, um, and uniform distances are defined, and of course absolute time as well to make sense of a statement like that. So ultimately, 
Newton came at this from a dynamical point of view, and the picture you have is one space as a fixed background arena in which matter evolves according to the laws. And then, of course, finally here we have um, Einstein, again, skipping through a great deal of history and thought, um, and particularly, you know, reaction of a relationist nature to Newton's picture, to Einstein and the theory of relativity. In the first place, the theory of special relativity, um, which really, from the point of view the of, the, of, the, of <coughs> I'm discussing this, is much like absolute space. I mean, it has a different, space and time have a different relationship. But in terms of the question of the nature of matter and space, or matter and space time, things are much the same. There's just Minkowski space time, it's the fixed background, and matter is something that lives out its life according to appropriate laws in the, on that stage. General relativity changes things fundamentally, of course, because from a dynamical point of view, now the dynamics of space-time encapsulated in uh, G, the space-time metric, and then the uh, Riemann tense, the, the curvature tensors, and scalar curvature, now is not static, but is dynamic, and in the einstein hilbert field equation coupled to um, the stress-energy tensor. So it's not a fixed background in that sense, but on a footing dynamically with matter. But still, I mean, one could discuss exactly how um, geometry, geometry and matter, space-time and matter, are to be understood in um, general relativity. But at least at first glance, it still looks like they are two different kinds of things. I have the geometry over here on the left-hand side, that's the properties of space, and separate from that, the, st the stress-energy tensor on the right-hand side, which represents matter. So we still have a certain disunity between space and matter, or space-time and matter in this case. Matter is something that's in space-time, even though they're dynamically related. Okay, I know some people want to think of this G, the metric field, as more on a par with a, mat with a matter field. It's just another kind of um, matter. But, okay, that's a discussion we won't have here. But looking back over all of that, all of these major milestones in the development of physics I'm looking at them here from a, the, the point of view of focusing on the question of the relationship. Now, what is matter? What is space? What is time? Space time? And, and what is time? I haven't really spoken about that. How are they related in terms of constitution? Is matter something different from space, or is it in some sense just a form of space? And also, what is the dynamical relationship between them? Is space just a background? How do these two things interact, if at all? So there's a long historical question here, and the points of um, the lectures that I'm going to be talking about, and string theory in particular, is how does the story change once we try to, or one tries to quantize gravity? Take Einstein's um, general relativity, some kind of classical field theory, and apply the idea that's been successfully applied to other field theories that are known, especially electromagnetism, and find a quantum theory of it. Again, we could talk about the necessity of quantizing gravity and wondering whether there's the possibility of having a classic, keeping gravity classical, but other fields um, quantum. There are powerful arguments that that's not a possible situation, but perhaps those arguments also have, have holes. But our point of view, we're going to pursue that um, question about uh, quantizing gravity, and in particular, think about the string theoretic approach to quanti quantizing gravity, and think about what it says about the nature of matter, and in particular, about the nature of space-time, 
and, as I say, uh, their relations. Okay. I think the time's going about right. So, that's enough history. Um, as I say, to think about, I'm going to, raise, I'm going to be raising some philosophical questions about string theory, and I wanted, as I said, to give this history so that you can see the questions I'm raising as part of a tradition of um, questioning and study um, of these matters. And maybe the other thing I would say is the further back you go, it seems the more obvious it is that the questions being asked are philosophical ones. When you go back to Plato and you see what he's saying, it's hard to sort of see that as, uh, as, as physics. So, well maybe this is to put it things too strongly, but what I want to sort of suggest is the existence of physical, of philosophical questions in current um, uh, physical research programs is not always that obvious, but as you get further away in time, those questions, the, the, the philosophical nature of the questions, I think, becomes sort of more obvious. And when people look back on string theory or programs in quantum gravity in a thousand years' time or a hundred years' time, what is being done now is going to look the, the philosophical aspects of it are going to be clearer. Okay. Well, we had some discussion about this yesterday. I don't complain. I'm not claiming it's all. It's, I'm not claiming that it's all philosophy, but the philosophical part of the program becomes clearer. So this was hopefully by way of loosening up a little bit about this. Okay. So we'll start. Uh, we'll finish off this first half by talking uh, about uh, classical string, uh, the, the theory of the classical string, and then we'll come back in the next lecture after the break and quantize it. Um, and you can, but you can see even at the classical level the basic idea of the string theoretic account of what matter is, matter as we understand it so far. So. The rest of today is just a basic introduction to the fundamental ideas of string theory. Given, given the time, and given that you have physics professors who I'm sure could do a better job of a thorough string theory course, I'm just going to paint in pretty broad strokes. Um, the presentation is going to be heuristic, heuristica. I wanted to look up the word of Portuguese. I hope that I said it right. <laughs> it's, I, I want to sh show um, the big picture of, what str of how string theory is constructed rather than the details of the derivation. If you want to see more details, I'm sure you can take a course here. You can go read um, the books by um, Green, Schwartz, and Witten, or um, Becker, Becker, and Schwartz, or Polchinski. Uh, and then you can see how these things have developed um, more precisely and in more detail. But what I'm going to present is, as I say, sort of an overview that covers today you know, everything from the first chapter or two chapters of those kind of textbooks, so you can understand the framework in general. The basic idea, so, string theory has a reputation, well, and it's a truth, of being uh, a very complicated and profound mathematical theory, indeed a theory that's dropped from the next century that we don't understand. But the there are basic intuitive ideas that are actually pretty familiar and to start thinking about it and enough for what we want to talk about I hope to show you not that you know, easy to, to, to grasp. Okay, 
Um, that's what I'm interested in, right, is, is the key physical ideas that go into this. I should mention, uh, I mentioned the th three textbooks. Um, another thing that you might find useful, so again, I'm, I can see the audience is a, is a mixed one. I'm, I think there are some physics undergraduates. I see some people who are either very long-term students or faculty. Um, so I'm giving this presentation to people with a lot of different backgrounds. So please bear with me if it's, if it's slow. Um, for people who this is pushing, um, to see these things worked out in some more detail, I also recommend some very nice le um, lectures that you can find on, online on YouTube and other places. Um, again, by Leonard Susskind. Um, these are lectures that he gave at Stanford, not to undergraduates, but to a, a general sort of post-education audience. And they, again, are nice for understanding the basic, the theory at a basic conceptual level, rather than the, the physical details that you need if you want to really um, work in string theory. But again, that's a nice uh, second step as well. Okay, so to make things easier, I brought a string with me. Almost. Uh, I was very happy to see this. So a string, we're going to think, we're going to start with the classical relativistic string. And you'll see the basic ideas that go into it are probably what you would think to write down if you started wondering what a relativistic classical string would look like. Um, so here it is. It has some internal tension as it, as it stretches. Um, has a location in space. It can move around. And I have to look up. You can see when, you, um, when it's moving freely. I should do. I'll throw it up. Ah, OK. I should have practiced a little bit. <laughs> it vibrates, it takes on various rotational and vibrational modes. I think I have, when you do it, you can see it, it sort of has a double mode. You'll get um, two. I think I have managed to throw it hard enough to get it to do three sometimes, but that's the feature of this one, of the, no, this spring. So, well, in the break, if anyone wants to play with it, uh, you're welcome to, but I mean this spring is uh, non. I mean, it's non relative. The world's relativistic, so it's relativistic. I mean, you think the basic description of this you would think of in the first place in terms of Hooke's law, and so you think of this as sort of describe this as a non in a non relativistic way. Um, you see the the string we're interested in is a relativistic string, so a little different, but. Having that picture in mind and just thinking about what equations you'd write down to describe that, um, that very object is, I think, a good way to be, is the way you want to be thinking about classical string theory. Okay, um, so one thing to think about, and I should say, today we'll really talk about um, the story of the nature of matter in string theory. Um, in the following lectures, we'll turn to the other question about the nature of space-time and, and within string theory. So, in that light, the basic idea of uh, the story of the, the conception of matter in string theory, well, you can again see in this model. I mean, this spring is quite big, but if this were really, really small small to the point that you couldn't see that it was a string, looked like a point particle to you, those different ways of vibrating would look like internal degrees of freedom of a point particle. They would look like what you would think was going on was when it's going like, well, you can really only make it go one way, as I said. When it's vibrating with a double mode, it looks like one kind of particle. When it's vibrating in a different mode, there's some internal degree of freedom um, you know, that takes on a different value, 
And you could interpret that as being a different species of particle. So the way, when you look at it in the big, the different vibrations, you can see what they are. From the point of view, if the, spring is, uh, the string is very small, it's going to look like internal degrees of freedom, and indeed, well, as we'll see, look like different species of particle. Okay, that's the basic idea, and we'll get that um, again. And, by the way, the string, spring, strings are very small because they have a lot of tension that keeps them from getting too long. So, that actually, the idea is that is how they are. Okay, so we want um, a relativistic, uh, do the simplest uh, sort of model, way of modeling this situation you can think of. Let's have a relativistic theory and let's have it forced, force free. There's no external forces. Um, and in particular, there's no <coughs> gravity. So we're going to postulate um, a Minkowski space time for the theory. Okay, it's just special relativity. And we'll see this is right. It's a, it, it's, the string is spring like, but what's the tension going to be? Uh, it seems that the tension has to be constant. So you're used to you know, uh, non relativistic physics, we have Hooke's law, so, and the tension depends on the length that it's stretched. But length is not an invariant um, concept in relativity. So to make the theory relativistic, it's, you're going to end up with a um, constant tension that's framing, otherwise, it looks like you can't have a frame, de frame dependent tension. That doesn't, doesn't make sense. The way around that is to have a, a constant tension. Okay, so it's a little different in that regard from a non relativistic um, string. So you can see, let's, let me draw some pictures. Here. And I'll, I'll stop here and move over here. So, we first want space time, some manifold M, and let it have d plus 1 dimensions. I suspect you know that we don't start with 3 plus 1 because in string theory famously d has to either be, um, uh, in this case, 25 or 10, um, 9 I mean, with the plus 1. Um, we're not going to have time to uh, talk about that, I'm afraid. And I'll draw two of the dimensions here. So x0, of course, will be the, the time. I'm picking some particular frame. x1 is the x-coordinate. And I've got d of these, these spatial coordinates. And today we will, and, um, well, today we will refer to this as space-time. Tomorrow we'll see that there might be something problematic in that idea. Uh, but that's okay. Right now we're thinking primarily mathematically, and from a mathematical formal point of view, this is Minkowski space-time. That's exactly what I mean um, in this point of view. The question of, is it this space-time in which we're sitting and passing this lecture? That's the interpretational question that's more complicated. And then in this space-time, so imagine these axes are extended over to here as well. Let's think what we want to do to think in a space-time way about what the motion of the string looks like, a string or spring. How would I kind of picture this? <clears throat> well, with time going up and x along here, well, at one point it's here, later on it's over here, and so the string, of course, sweeps out a world sheet in time, a two-dimensional surface um, with one space-like direction and one time-like direction in space, and we're going to need, let's call this W for the string world sheet. The picture I've drawn here is of an open string. The ends don't join up. 
Um, and we're going to want to have, to, to formulate the theory, there's going to be a second set of coordinates. So there's d plus 1 coordinates for the background Minkowski space-time. There's going to be a second set of coordinates, just a pair of coordinates that live on the world sheet so that I can label all the points of the world sheet. And we'll say the sigma ones go from 0 to pi. If you look at textbooks, sometimes it's 2 pi. It's, and, and it's easy to kind of get mixed up with going between them. Um, but okay, So that's an open string. I haven't found a nice model. I, I guess it wouldn't be too hard. I should work on it. Um, of a closed string, but I could have a string that was like this joined together at the end, and you think about that moving in, in a similar kind of way. That would be a closed string. So that's all a loop at some time, and a different configuration of the same loop at a different time. And yeah, all right. Something like that. Again, another world sheet. This is a closed string. And same, we'll have coordinates on it, and we'll make, again, the space-like sigma coordinate can go as, you know, can be whatever you can take on any value, but we'll say it, it has a periodicity of pi. So if you go in that, around from zero to pi in that coordinate, you come back to the, at a fixed time, you come back to the same point. Okay. So those are the, that's what a string looks like, an open string or a closed string looks like in space-time. And a trajectory then is going to be some function oops, from points of the world sheet to points of space-time. I'm actually going to draw on here. Here's a particular point on the world sheet. Suppose it's the point sigma comp tau. That point lives at some point of space-time. That point of the world sheet lives at some point of space-time. And the coordinates of that point of space-time are x mu. So the way to write to express the dynamics of this, the trajectory of the string, is to assign to each point of the way of the world sheet um, the corresponding point of space-time, the point at which that uh, point of the world sheet lives in, in space-time. In other words, the trajectory is going to be described, the, the evolution is going to be described by a function that takes you from points of the world sheet to points of um, space-time. And again, it means there's this fun a function um, x mu, from each point of the world sheet. But there are two ways of looking at this. From the space-time point of view, you would think of what this function describes is the position of the point, the world sheet point, sigma tau. You're thinking of this as describing how the string is embedded in space-time for each point of the string where it is in space-time. But if I look at this more formally, and I think about what it looks like from the world sheet, and I look at the world sheet, and I think, hey, this is like a two-dimensional space-time. It has space and it has time in it. I've got my d plus one dimensional <coughs> Minkowski space-time, but I also have this two-dimensional object which itself, at least formally, looks like a space-time, a two-dimensional space-time. And from that perspective, this function here is a vector field living on the world sheet. Okay, Not, not tangent vectors to the world sheet but I mean a d plus one dimensional kind of object that lives on the world sheet at each point. Or, or if you like, just d plus one scalar fields that are living, living on the world sheet. 
And these are two points of view which both play a role in thinking about string theory. They play a role um, formally, and they play a role um, to some degree conceptually as well. There are these two different perspectives. I mean, formally equivalent. Um, okay. So, we will see these coming back up, up, up again. What would be reasonable to expect here for the dynamics? That's the basic picture. Well, for a relativistic theory, we probably are going to expect, I haven't yet told you, and I won't really. Um, that's part of the more detailed development, exactly how to write these coordinates on the world sheet. But what you might expect is that it's possible to write um, coordinates on the world sheet for which a relativistic wave equation is satisfied. I'm going to set certainly all the fundamental constants to 1 in what I write down. So this is c equals 1. Later we'll have h bar equals 1. Um, as I said, this is sort of broad picture conceptual, so at points I'll be also setting things like 2 pi to 1 and so forth. Okay, so you just, it's the form that's, that's important. Okay. <coughs> this relativ a relativistic wave equation like this seems a perfectly reasonable kind of a, equation of motion to expect for this relativistic string that we're developing. Um, if you look at a textbook, this comes out at the end of the story rather than the beginning. I'm kind of reversing the story, um, so I know this is this is the right one, but it seems very physically kind of motivated. Okay. So let's, what did we get to? Right, so this is what I've just been saying. You start off thinking about, you want to describe how the string is embedded in space-time. So each point has um, d plus one space-time coordinates. But we can equally well think of this as a field on the, on the, world, on the world sheet. <laughs> subject to a nice relativistic um, wave equation. And this is a very simple equation. The general solutions can then be decomposed into oscillations. As I said, when you don't see that you have a string, but you see that it's, you think that it's so tiny it looks like a particle, um, these oscillations look like internal degrees of freedom of the particle somehow. But from our point of view, the what's important here is here's the nah. okay. Here's a general solution to this equation broken out into oscill oscillatory modes. Um, to keep things simple, I'm going to assume that the space-time, the Minkowski space-time is a box. So we just have um, discrete modes. We don't have to worry about um, arbitrary, arbitrary wavelengths. And, okay. Sorry, I need to do that. I need to do this. Okay, so look at this equation. Look at this general solution. The first term clearly is just the center of mass of the, something like the center of mass of the string. Then there's a term that describes how it's moving, the velocity of the center of mass, something like that. And then there are all these other terms um, that describe um, oscillations on the string. So these terms here, are, uh, I put the time dependence into uh, the oscillations over here. So we have some constant terms here, uh, the amplitudes of the different modes that we have here, and then the oscillations um, of a, all different possible uh, wavelengths over here. So I have cosines, just to address one issue, I have cosines here rather than uh, no signs because I'm assuming, if you know something about sort of wave equations, that we have Neumann boundary conditions. 
Um, these will come from uh, fixing momentum conservation at the ends of the string. Later on, we can also consider a, a, a Dirichlet boundary conditions where the string is sort of fixed to something. But we have cosines, to cut a long story short, so that we have conservation of um, momentum at the ends of the string. And, right, these modes are labeled by um, N. Okay, the, this is for an open string. For a closed string, things are much the same, except instead of just having one set of vibrations, you'll have vibrations moving leftwards and vibrations moving rightwards. So it'll be look like this, as if you have, um, as it were, two two open strings, one corresponding to um, waves moving to the left and one corresponding to waves to the right. Uh, but otherwise, it's um, pretty similar. And, okay. So we'll come back to this form as well. Um, but as I, as I sort of indicated, what, what the different um, modes of vibration are going to be um, distinguished by different amplitudes for the modes here. And when the string looks like a, a point, these look like internal degrees of freedom. You don't see them as vibrations of the string. They somehow parameterize the string, so they look like different particles, particles that are internally different in some way or another. So hold on to that idea. OK, as in much uh, you know, a lot of physics, looking at things from the point of view of an action principle um, is desirable. We'll make things uh, simpler. And just, uh, again, I'm not sure exactly who uh, is in the audience, so let me just, just repeat things for anybody who is sort of earlier in their uh, um, physics career. So the idea is, what's the, the central idea here is Hamilton's principle. Um, every physically, every... Um, If you imagine being given initial and final states of some system and think about all the different paths that could take you from the initial state to the final state, this quantity, the action, assigns a number to each of those paths. The action is essentially we get from integrating the difference of the potential and kinetic energy along the path. And Hamilton's principle says the possible physically allowed trajectory, the way the system will actually move from the initial point to the final point, um, is the one that has the least value of the action, um, or more precisely, that uh, maximizes the value of the action. Um, so some of the reasons, uh, if that's an unfamiliar concept to you, um, then some of the readings that I provided from Susskind is a chapter where he talks about this idea in general and gives some examples. Otherwise, the idea seems clear enough and why it fits in with regular physics is the you know, more familiar physics um, is what you can look up. But this is the basic idea for Hamilton's principle. And it helps to switch to this point of view in string theory, especially when one goes to quantum mechanics. And one way of writing down one suitable action for the classical string is the so-called, is the Nambu-Gotu action, which simply says the action of any, take any um, string trajectory, so that's some particular world sheet from some initial string to some final string. <coughs> The quantity that's assigned to the, any particular trajectory between those two is just proportional to the space-time area of the corresponding world sheet. Um, and then there's a constant t that's involved in the action. Because remember, the action is it's, it, it's a quantity. You know, it's a quantity. It's the integrated potential difference of the potential and kinetic energy. So the action you write down is um, the world time. Uh, world sheet space-time area, 
that action plus Hamilton's principle then give a really beautiful geometric understanding of the dynamics of the relativistic string. It just, given an initial and a final state, it's going to move so that the world sheet has the mi minimum um, space-time area possible. It's kind of going to be the smallest world sheet compatible with the beginning and the end. <coughs> and that's actually kind of analogous to the similar um, action for a free particle in special relativity, where the um, action goes like the space-time length, which forces the particle, a free particle to move along a geodesic, along the straightest path possible. So this is sort of the two-dimensional two equivalent of um, the free particle action, which is the space-time length of the, the interval, so particles move along straight lines. Okay, I should say this is in fact not the most mathematically useful form um, of the action, and in practice one uses the Polyakov action, which has a rather nicer mathematical form, and in particular when one uh, moves to the quantum theory, is better defined than the Nandu go to action. However, at the classical level, these two actions are demonstrably equivalent. So this is fine for our purposes, so we'll just talk about this, about um, Nambu go to action. Okay. Okay, let me skip that part. Okay. I should um, connect this up with what I've said uh, earlier. This action, or in particular the equivalent Polyakov action, when you apply the usual techniques of um, uh, Lagrangian mechanics and seek to, to you know, vary the path to find the minimum, find where the minimum of the action is, when you use uh, the usual sort of standard methods of calculus of variations in terms of the degrees of freedom here, of course. What you find is this is the equation of motion that comes out of the action. So these, uh, this action is the one that gives indeed, indeed gives this um, equation of motion. And what you can also see, well, there's some other things that you can see. You can see that the Neumann momentum conserving uh, boundary conditions of one possibility. You see Dirichlet um, fixed bound endpoint boundary conditions are possible. You will also see, again, the equivalent of the Polyakov action, and you will also see something that's kind of important is, oh, let me not say that, I need to talk, we have to talk about the Polyakov action, about that, to see that. Okay, so this is the right action, it gives you what, gives us what we wanted. Okay, nearly there, for the first part. We want to say something more specific about how the internal degrees of freedom, what they look like if you, when, you, um, when the string is very small and is appearing as a particle to you. So this is the part where I'm simply going to have to give you the formula. I can explain, deriving it is not super complicated, but it would take more time than, than we have now and introduce more ideas than we have time to, time to discuss or really need to discuss. But look, look up here. Okay. So this is our general equation of motion for the string. And we see there's a velocity term here. So if you were looking at the string as a particle, that velocity would be related to the four momentum of that, part, of, of, of that particle. That would, that, that would be relevant to the, the, what the full momentum was, and so the mass is important. So, I know from relativity that any particle has to satisfy um, uh, the energy moment, the mass energy momentum, standard mass energy momentum formula. The mass squared of the particle has to be equal to the energy squared uh, minus uh, the ordinary. Um, three momentum, or in this case, d momentum squared. This is just, I mean, each of the, the left-hand side is just the four, the, um, four momentum squared, uh, 
Right. The full momentum squared, when the particle's at rest, all the, mass, all the energy is in the form of mass, and if it's moving, then the full momentum squared is, is this quantity. Okay. But the full momentum squared is an invariant, so uh, mass squared has to equal e squared minus p squared. This p squared, as I said, um, is related to this v squared. Okay. So the mass has to be related to this v squared. It also turns out, and this is the piece that I'm not going to fill in, but you can see in a few pages in any textbook, this v squared is related to, um, because of the symmetries of the action, to the um, vibrational modes of the string. There's um, a, necessary um, in, uh, a necessary relation between this term and these terms because of the symmetries of the theory. So coming back down here, v, because of relativity, the v, the v term is related to the mass of the particle, the apparent um, mass of the particle, and the p is also related then through the v um, to the mode terms, and the net result is this. To perform, there is a formula for the apparent mass of a stringy particle, so a very small string that appears as a particle, where the mass squared is given by the tension times the sum over this product here. And so, <clears throat> these terms here are the amplitudes of the different modes, the vibration of the string. And so, what this expression is telling us is, not too surprisingly, when a string looks like a particle, its mass, its apparent mass as a particle, is going to depend on how the string is vibrating. And since we think of mass as characterizing different species of particles, different system, different kinds of vibrations of the string will appear as different kinds of particles. Okay, those internal degrees of freedom, not surprisingly, since they constitute energy, will then look like uh, the mass of different, part of, uh, different particle masses um, when one looks, when the string is very small and looks like a particle. When it is, as I've said here, a stringy particle, by that I mean a string that's really small so that it appears like a particle. Okay, so that is the out outline of classical string theory. The next job will be to quantize it, but the picture is you want to think of what we're interested in is the motion of a world sheet, what's the dynamics for a world sheet in space-time, as a simple wave, relativistic wave equation, so simple uh, solution um, with vibrations, it has a very nice interpretation um, in terms of uh, Lagrangian mechanics. The dynamics, this dynamics just says the string is as small as possible in a space-time sense given the initial and final states. And a more careful analysis of that action then leads to a relationship between the apparent particle mass of a stringy particle and the amplitude of the, mode of the vibrations of that string.